Hello, I'm Professor Congleton, and this is Econ 441, Public Economics at West Virginia University. Uh, this is the continuation of an in-class lecture that I did uh, just uh, uh, a day before yesterday. Uh, during that lecture, we talked about the economics of the Social Security program. Provide a little bit of an outline in terms of the history of, uh, of, of the Social Security types of programs that were adopted throughout uh, Europe and, uh, and, and throughout uh, related countries, you know, Canada, the United States, and Australia, and so forth. Uh, uh, but just kind of br uh, really briefly, in today's lecture, we're, we're going to shift the focus from the, the pure economics of the Social Security program and its effects on retirement ages and, and things of that sort, and talk a little bit about the political economy of it, uh, both in general terms uh, with the median voter model, uh, and then we're going to go through the history in a little bit more detail. Uh, and the lecture is divided into two parts. The first part is on the political economy of uh, Social Security, and the second part is on the history. Uh, and there'll be a break in between those two parts, uh, so you can, you know, scribble down some notes or uh, take a break uh, or, or do whatever you feel like, and then watch the second part. The first part is more... Uh, important for the exam coming up after Thanksgiving break uh, uh, than, uh, than the second part. Um, but the second part, I think, is important for you as a, an individual citizen to understand how the program has changed through time and why it's changed uh, and, to, uh, and to think about both the politics and economics associated with those changes. So what I'm going to do first is talk about the median voter uh, uh, model of Social Security. Okay, and when I do these recorded lectures at home, I'm sitting in my, I'm talking, I'm standing in my basement right now. Uh, I am assuming that you are taking notes just like you would in class, but I'm not uh, pausing you know, to give you the time to write the notes down. Right? So I assume that you can hit the pause button and jot down notes and, and just and do that as often as you want to, uh, to keep up with what I'm talking about. But uh, essentially, I'm just kind of gonna, going to go straight through without uh, hesitation. And of course, that's one of the disadvantages of pre-recorded uh, lectures. Uh, I can't see you guys uh, uh, to know uh, whether you're writing or not, whether you're interested or not, whether, you're, whether whatever I'm saying is connecting or not uh, in the way that I can in the classroom. So this, that's a disadvantage of these. But on the other hand, they're better than nothing, for sure. Uh, and they're a nice complement to the written notes that we, we have on the web for the course. So let's talk about the Social Security model of Social Security expenditures. Okay, so uh, this is a, an idea developed by a guy named Edgar Browning uh, in the 1970s. So this is the Browning model, I guess you'd say. And the idea is that uh, the median voter uh, uh, is of median age and income. All right, so we've talked about the median voter in, term, in income terms before in class. Uh, that's the easiest way to interpret some of those diagrams where the marginal benefit curves all come out of the axis at the same point. Uh, but we've not talked about the possibility that uh, age would affect the way people make decisions as well as income. And so uh, Browning's uh, insight uh, was that especially with respect to retirement, age matters a good deal. And that's because it changes the uh, expected benefits and expected costs of saving for retirements and of benefiting from retirement savings. Uh, and in effect, Browning assumes that people use something like the present discounted value, uh, a term you would have picked up in finance or, or, or in some other economics classes, in, in which I don't have time to elaborate much here in this, uh, in this, this mini lecture. Uh, and in general, the way present value works is the closer you are in time to a benefit, the more valuable it is to you, the more tangible it is to you. And the further off it is, uh, the less valuable, the less tangi tangible it is for you. And so the less important it is for your kind of day-to-day decision-making. Uh, and so a person of median age 
uh, uh, which at the time Browning was writing was say around uh, 40, would be expecting to spend, uh, pay 20 years of taxes uh, uh, be before he got to benefits from a social security program. After that, the program benefits would be, uh, would be there uh, f for the rest of his life. And that would, that would be a good thing. So he's willing to pay, make a, uh, make a, a tax uh, a sacrifice, pay a tax <clears throat> in order to get that benefit in the future. Uh, but not an infinite tax, right? Because you have to pay the tax now and because it's closer to him in the present, you know, it's basically something he's going to do right now and next year and the year after and the year after. It's closer than the benefits, which are way off. Uh, uh, the taxes are more salient, right, uh, than they would be. So even though the median voter has below average income, will pay less than an average price for this uh, uh, annuity that in a sense he's getting from the government. Uh, uh, the taxes are kind of closer to him, and so they, they have a, a significant effect on his calculations. Okay, so if you, uh, if you think about it, uh, if you thought there was a single person who was the median voter, which is more or less the way we model these things, then that person would get older through time and maybe their income goes up through time. Okay. However, uh, what uh, Browning points out is that the, median, the person of median age is different every year. Right? So if the median age is 40, and, and let's suppose for a second that, that the median age doesn't change. Okay, we have a stable population uh, profile of ages. Uh, then the median voter of last year is 41 this year, and he's now or she wants more benefits uh, than he did or she did when she was 40 because she's closer to retirement. On the other hand, the person coming up behind who was 39 the previous year is now 40 and, and is the median voter and make similar trade-offs to uh, the 41-year-old uh, uh, made you know, that, that, uh, you know, when he was uh, or she was uh, 40. And so that tends to stabilize the, the benefit levels through time, this turnover in the median voter, the person of median age. Uh, and so what his model boils down to is something like this. There's some kind of marginal benefit in present value terms associated uh, with a retirement benefit and there's some kind of marginal cost again in present value terms <coughs> uh, associated with the taxes And that means that there's some kind of ideal uh, benefit level for a given median voter. Now, as um, one's age increases, you get closer to retirement. And the effect on your preferred benefit level goes up. Um, yeah, the, uh, so it turns out, you know, because of the shape of the population profile uh, that the median age has been increasing through time. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the biggest one is that in the period from 1945 to 1965, 
a lot of children were born. Uh, that's called the baby boom generation. So during World War II, there weren't so many uh, children born because of the risks of war and the guys all out of the front lines fighting. And during the Great Depression, uh, again, babies weren't as common because uh, it, it's expensive to raise a family and people were pretty poor and uh, you know, nervous about their future incomes in that period. And so uh, uh, both these uh, uh, periods tended to reduce uh, birth rates. Well, after World War II was over, there was kind of a big uh, relief uh, from these two previous catastrophes uh, and, and, and birth, rates, birth rates went way up. And so you had a large uh, number of, of families uh, started in that period. Uh, and that uh, sort of extra bump in the population profile is kind of working its way through the age distribution. Uh, and now basically the baby boomers are, are retiring. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and that effect, uh, the, 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 the fact that the median voter be, is becoming older through time, probably because family sizes are smaller now than they were in the baby boom period, uh, and probably because the baby boomers are getting older, uh, tends to increase the median voters' preferred benefit level. And if you think about the, the effect of increases in income associated with economic growth uh, during, during the past 50 years, uh, you can th think of uh, annuities as a normal good. As your income goes up, you tend to be willing to buy a larger uh, annuity. And so that's, that, that also tends to increase uh, uh, benefit levels. Although in, that, although in this particular case, it turns out that, that your perceived benefit goes up, your willingness to pay for it goes up, but also your taxes go up. So you get shifts in both curves. So it's not uh, ex ante, completely obvious uh, which effect dominates. But if it's a normal good, then you expect the, uh, 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 the income effect to dominate this uh, cost effect. Uh, and so that's benefit, that's uh, uh, a Brownie's uh, uh, median voter model, it turns out that if you use this model to try to track the benefits in the United States, it works quite well. You can account for, say up through 1980, you can account for over 90% of the changes in, in benefit levels using this uh, median voter type of model. Uh, in the period after, say, 1985, uh, it's uh, uh, the median, the, the Social Security program has, in a sense, been insulated from uh, uh, from political pressures to a significant degree through a series of reforms that are often called the Greenspan reforms. And we're going to talk about the history of the Social Security program and the Greenspan reforms in part two of this lecture. Uh, but for now, uh, the takeaway uh, from this uh, Brownie model uh, is that you can explain and account for the average benefit levels of the uh, uh, of the Social Security program in the United States, at least. And I think you, you know, this ge general approach also works pretty well for the European models. Uh, uh, simply by thinking about uh, the present value of benefits and taxes uh, as borne by the median voter, where the median voter is a voter of median age uh, and median income, where age is, in a sense, the most important new ingredient in this model over the other ones that we've talked about. So jot this down, think about it a bit. This could, this could well turn up on the exam. Um, uh, and then uh, I'm going to take a break, and you can take a break, uh, and I'll come back for part two of the lecture in just a, uh, in, in my time, a few minutes. Uh, and I will erase this board and put on another board of, uh, of material dealing with the, the history of the program. So I'll see you in a few minutes. I'm back uh, for part two of the, uh, of the lecture. So the first part, we talked about the political economy of Social, of Social Security, and now we're just going to talk a little bit about the history. And of course, that history reflects political economy and decisions made by voters in the Congress through time. Uh, and, uh, and so the, the other 
uh, explanations uh, remain relevant. And we'll, we'll try to interleave those a little bit with the discussion here of the, of the history of the program. Okay, as I mentioned in class in the last lecture, uh, Social Security programs generally started in Europe um, in the period, say, between 1890 and 1910, something like that. Uh, a lot of um, uh, national governments adopted uh, various combinations of health insurance and, uh, and, and pension programs that were tax financed uh, or financed through something that was like a tax, where the money went into a special fund that was separate from the normal uh, budget of the government. Um, uh, and, and that uh, system was uh, uh, very popular in Europe, uh, and some, some states in the country also tried to adopt uh, programs similar in spirit to those programs. Uh, but the Supreme Court, for one reason or another, knocked them down. I, I think basically it, the Supreme Court, Court thought that uh, redistribution was not a legitimate function of government, that that should be done through uh, private and public charities uh, rather than through the tax system. Uh, and, 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 and so that uh, it was illegitimate for governments to be involved in these kinds of activities. Um, but uh, nonetheless, there was electoral pressure at the, at least at the state level for these, and that favored these programs in many parts of the country. Uh, and eventually uh, for the nation, nation as a whole. But the, the trigger event that, that caused this legislation to be adopted was the Great Depression. The Great Depression in the United States ran from roughly 1929 until about 1940. Uh, and it's not that it was sort of one terrible thing for that whole period, but basically it was a kind of a fairly miserable period where you had really high growth rates go into the negative zone uh, and, and, uh, and then kind of recover a bit and come back again and go back up and down. So you had this, uh, uh, you know, a little over a 10-year period of really low economic growth and really high unemployment for much of that period. Uh, at its peak, unemployment was on the order somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. Uh, and uh, remember, in these days, there were no safety net programs, at least not at the national level. Right? So there's no food stamps, there's no welfare. Uh, and, and some states had um, some, you know, uh, provided various kinds of kind of local support uh, for people who are uh, extremely poor. Uh, but these programs are not very generous. Uh, uh, and so when you had 20% unemployment, you had 20% of the people with essentially no income coming in the front door. Okay, because for the most part, these were kind of one earner households. Now today, if you had 20% unemployment, which would be huge, you know, we haven't had anything like that since the Great Depression. Uh, the highest has been around 10%. Uh, we would have, uh, in most places, most, in most families, there would be still somebody else uh, earning a living because there's so many two-income households these days. Right? So back in the 30s, that was quite unusual. Uh, and today, it's, uh, it's the norm that you'd have two household incomes in a, in a family with a, with a mother and father both living together in the same place. Uh, so even on the on the basis of income, it would have a smaller effect on uh, cash flow within the family uh, than during the Great Depression. Uh, so the relative numbers of unemployment uh, actually don't tell the full story. The, the story is sort of tougher okay, in terms of its effect on the guys living through this period uh, than a similar number, which would be you know, regarded as a major problem for us uh, today. Uh, you know, uh, even though our, our problems would be on average uh, less than the ones faced in those, in those uh, earlier days. So uh, Social Security uh, was initially a whole a series of things. It wasn't just the pension program for older people, uh, which is the way I normally use the term uh, in this uh, class. Uh, uh, it, it, when it was passed, it included a national unemployment insurance program that was sort of jointly run by the states. Uh, and it's still run by the states, but I don't believe that that part of the program is still part of the Social Security Administration. So it's been kind of, you know, those programs have been separated through time. Uh, and what we're interested in Social Security uh, as, it, as it looks today, uh, in part because it's such a large program, right? It's currently the largest single area of expenditure by the U.S. federal government. Um, and the second largest is um, uh, Medicare. Uh, the, Healthcare benefits that are uh, provided to retired people. 
And so this, this whiteboard provides kind of a short history of the major reforms of the program that took place between 1935 and 1985. If you go to the web notes, you'll see a much more detailed account. Uh, and rather than replicate my web notes on here or do a bunch of slides that may basically have me read the web notes to you, I thought I would provide the summary and just remind you that if you want the more detailed history, just go to the web notes. So the, the summary is, okay, program starts in 1935. It's old age insurance program or old, uh, old age pension program, had both names at that time. But the one that stuck was old age insurance. So OAI was the name of the, the abbreviation for the program in the beginning, OAI, old age insurance program. In 1939, survivorship benefit, benefits were added. What's a survivorship benefit? Well, if you're married um, and the, the, the income earner dies, the survivor is the spouse, okay? Uh, and and uh, under the original program, that spouse would not have qualified for the benefits uh, earned by her husband in, in most cases. Um, uh, so survivorship meant that, the, in a sense, the benefits that you that the, the, the breadwinner had accumulated through his working uh, would be inherited by his spouse or her spouse, depending on who was the, the main breadwinner in the family. As, as I said, in this period, it's mostly the guys. Um, in 1940, the first checks were issued, right? So that's a bit of a surprise. You tend to think, okay, well, we started the program in 35. Surely the, the checks would have started at the same time, but no, they didn't start for, start, uh, they didn't start to be issued for five years. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that the program, uh, first tried to, uh, produce a trust fund, uh, uh, and, I, I don't, and the trust fund was never really intended to be the, the main source of income for the program, but it was meant to be kind of a buffer program. So that if there were big swings in the tax revenue generated uh, by recessions or, you know, again, remember this is during, uh, being adopted during the Great Depression, where these big swings were, were commonplace, um, um, you would have the buffer to kind of help fund the program during the period when the tax revenues were way down uh, uh, below average. Okay, and you would accumulate buffer when the tax revenues are above average. Uh, and in the beginning, the program had a total tax burden of 2% of income, um, which was supposed to be divided in half just as it is, as it is today. So that feature of the, of the program uh, has been there right from the beginning. This idea that in principle, although not in, not in terms of economics, but in principle, the employer and employee pay, each pay half of the cost of the, of the program. Uh, and, and so each, each side was basically saying paying 1% of, of, of taxes, uh, of the tax burden. Uh, and the tax uh, was only on, I believe it was the first $3,000 of income. Well, in, in current dollar terms, that's about $36,000 or something like that which would have been a good middle-class income, uh, middle income in those days. Uh, a lot of working-class people during, the, during the, the, the nasty part of the Great Depression you know, were, were happy to take jobs at a dollar a day. Okay, it's, a, it's a very low salary, even for back then, when prices were much lower. So, in, 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 uh, so uh, the tax was a fairly light one. Uh, and the uh, uh, extent of income that was being taxed was probably comparable in terms of the income distribution uh, to what's being taxed today. Although as, a, as, a, as an amount in real dollars, it's, it's gone up significantly from this period till today's period. So this trust fund was built up and then they finally started issuing checks uh, in 1940. Uh, the checks were fairly small, but you know, obviously the prices were lower and then, and again, the purpose of the of the insurance program was basically to keep people, uh, to make people make, make people have some kind of pension and to make the poorest people have some income that would, they could count on uh, in their old age. So they wouldn't be uh, starving or uh, uh, heavily, uh, entirely reliable, rely, uh, and entirely dependent on their uh, families for income. In 1955, disability benefits were added all right, so if you couldn't work until age 65 because of health problems, uh, you could still get some benefits uh, from, out of the program. Uh, 
Uh, and <clears throat> that um, benefit has been expanded through time to cover um, uh, people who aren't approaching retirement and who have uh, a variety of disabilities that uh, wouldn't have been uh, considered such in the days when this, uh, this benefit was added. <clears throat> but <clears throat> you can see that that's added another letter to our uh, uh, formal name for Social Security. Uh, it, it became OASDI, which is the current name, Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance. Now you want to remember that, okay, because I often put it on the, the second midterm exam. What is the formal name for the Social Security program? Or I might just put those letters down and have you tell me what they were. So that one's worth remembering as, as is kind of the evolution that kind of gets you there in, in terms of the changes in the program that account for all those letters. In 1960, Medicare was created, which is a, a program uh, of tax finance um, medical insurance for older people, retired people. Uh, and then in 1966, Medicaid, which was a, a tax finance insurance program for uh, relatively poor people, was, uh, was added. Uh, and so by, uh, in this period, this 25-year uh, period, we, we basically created the, the, the the heart of what some people refer to as the, the welfare state. Okay, now these programs are all uh, pretty small, especially in the beginning in both cases, uh, and they both grown quite a bit through time. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, partly they can be explained through the, the Brownian model. Right? If you think of the median voter getting older through time, and you think of the uh, median voter becoming relatively uh, richer through time, uh, the median voter would tend to demand uh, uh, more uh, 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 more support when in, when in retirement, uh, even even given the tax cost of those programs, and right? so the perceived marginal benefits of those programs shifts out. Perceived marginal cost goes up, but not as much as the benefits, uh, and and the dual effect of increasing age of the median voter and higher income implies that the benefits of those programs would tend to go up. So that's a normal prediction out of a median voter type of model. Uh, it doesn't require any kind of nefarious interest group activities or anything like that going on. And both these programs have been really very popular since, the, since they were adopted. There have been problems with them, but the basic idea of the programs have been, uh, has, has been really broadly supported, uh, except in you know, kind of relatively small group of, of people who are uh, extreme fiscal conservatives, I guess. <clears throat> well, um, well, partly as a, as a consequence of these kind of electoral pressures, benefits have been increasing through time uh, and often were increased uh, without increasing the taxes, uh, which always, you know, taxpayers always imagine there's a free lunch somewhere in the system uh, and, uh, and for some reason are willing to support politicians who uh, at least claim to be able to do more with less, uh, even when they can't. Uh, and, and, and so electoral pressures uh, and political pr competition generated uh, increasingly generous benefit schedules for these uh, programs uh, and often did that without raising taxes to pay for them. Uh, as a consequence, the trust fund was kind of running out uh, in the 1970s and it was clearly in, you know, on a trajectory down to zero uh, and many people regarded the, the absence of a trust fund as being really important. Uh, it sounds important. Remember though, that the trust fund in this period was never uh, the main source of income uh, for the retired folks. It wasn't like uh, the trust funds that an insurance company that's making uh, promises about annuities has to, has to uh, uh, create in order to fund those annuities. Uh, because these, this program, both programs have always been pay-as-you-go programs, meaning that the retired people's uh, pensions, benefits, are being paid for by working people and by taxes on working people today. So essentially all the revenue that goes out the door in the way of benefits comes in the door uh, from uh, taxes paid by people who are currently working. Uh, and the trust fund uh, in this period was just a buffer to kind of deal with kind of fluctuations in taxes from year to year. Uh, but nonetheless, it sounded important and created a crisis mentality. And then 1980, after winning the election, President Reagan uh, created the Greenspan Commission, which is a, a group of uh, economists uh, and political, uh, politically influential folks 
uh, and politicians uh, to try to come up with a long-term solution to the Social Security program. Uh, and the commission came back with a series of reform proposals. Uh, and those uh, proposals were approved by Congress in 1985. Uh, and put the uh, Social Security system on a very firm, in fact, you could argue excessively firm, uh, fiscal footing uh, for, the, for the next 45 years. Um, and we're kind of running at the end of that period now, uh, where that, um, uh, that reform is no longer adequate to, uh, uh, to assure that benefits will be paid in the future. Uh, it's, uh, but again, these programs have been always been important, uh, always been important politically and always been widely supported politically. And at some point, another crisis will be uh, acknowledged and there'll be a new Grand Span Commission, I predict, and there'll be some reforms adopted um, that uh, solve the immediate fiscal problems that we're likely to face for the next uh, 20 or 25 years. <coughs> Now, <clears throat> uh, the Greenspan reforms increased the tax. Okay, the tax had been increasing all the way through time, but there was a fairly significant increase in the tax uh, uh, to fund this program associated with those reforms. And you can see the difference from uh, 1935, <coughs> when the total tax was 2%, to uh, 1985, when the tax is about 15% that the program has, uh, has grown more than sevenfold uh, in relative size during that period. So that's a really large increase. And part of that um, is just that there are more people uh, who are living long enough to retire. Right? So longevity is increasing during this time. Uh, but mainly it's uh, through changes in the average benefit levels. Right? So the real, real benefits went up during this time. Um, you know, partly because the whole society was richer. Uh, uh, and also, they were more willing to pay for it. You know, so the, the, the fact that the tax rate went up uh, a lot okay, uh, implies that, uh, you know, the, that the typical voter was willing to pay for this uh, uh, more, uh, uh, oh, I don't want to say extravagant, but more generous uh, uh, retirement uh, pension plan that uh, paid for through, through these taxes. The other thing that happened was that uh, during this period, uh, the minimal age for retirement went down. Okay, you would think that with longevity going up, minimum age would go up, but uh, that's not happened at this point. Uh, the Greenspan reforms actually did change the retirement age for what they call normal benefits slowly. Uh, it's been rising from 65 to, I think, 67. Uh, but uh, but the, 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 the youngest age at which you can retire remains 62. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and many people do retire at age 62. Uh, for a while, that was the most common age of retirement. Okay, so in terms of, of the median voter model, um, you can account for this change um, uh, pretty well. Uh, and in fact, I've uh, uh, published papers on this myself. Uh, where I used the median voter model to explain this uh, path of, of reform. Uh, in that particular paper, I also con contrasted the median voter model with a straight interest group model, where uh, you know, older people were able to kind of press or pressure the Congress disproportionately to their numbers uh, for this program. And it actually turns out that the interest group program uh, model works nearly as well as the median voter model. Uh, and a combined model actually worked a bit better than either a pure model by themselves. So the, the real trajectory through much of this period was uh, a combination of interest group and median voter uh, interests um, or support for the program. Um, in, in this course, I've been emphasizing the median voter model, uh, mostly because it's the model that uh, uh, that is most relevant if you think elections matter. If elections matter and that they are pushing policies in particular directions, uh, then electoral equilibria must determine what public policies look like. And if electoral equilibria are driving uh, public policies, then the, the easiest electoral e equilibria to justify or rationalize is the voter uh, one. 
and so that's the one we've been using uh, for this uh, for, for most of this class. But interest groups are operating all the time in the system, but for really large public programs, it seems to me that the median voter model is the most likely kind of causal element, and the interest group <coughs> aspects of of reforms. Uh, uh, are probably most evident in the kind of fine details of the program that the average voter wouldn't know much about. So let's talk a little bit about the Greenspan reforms. Um, so first of all, it's worth noting that the basic structure of the program, the pay-as-you-go structure, the fact that um, there's a retirement age of approximately 65, uh, and, the, uh, and the fact that the way, that wages are the tax base and that there's a cap on the top income uh, from uh, from wages from labor that uh, uh, were at which point the marginal tax rate falls to zero. All those were features from of the original bill uh, passed in 1935, and they're still features even after the Greenspan reforms in 1985. Okay, so next I want to talk about the Greenspan reforms. And there are a couple of things I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, first, the intent of the, of the Greenspan reforms was to insulate the program from day-to-day -day politics. Now, to get the forms, reforms through Congress, obviously it would have to be perceived that these reforms were in the interest of the median voter uh, or interest groups that were uh, pressuring to get these kinds of reforms adopted and to get the uh, pension program on, on sound financial footings. Uh, so when there, there's a sense in which uh, the long-term effects of the uh, reforms would have to pass political muster, right? It would have to look like they were advancing the long-term interests of the median voter or the interest groups uh, or some combination of the two, depending on which of the three models uh, you buy into as being the most uh, likely explanation for the path of Social Security. Okay, now uh, technically it does not, the bill does not insulate uh, the program from politics, right? There's, it's not a constitutional reform, okay? It's a, it's a piece of legislation that gets passed and in principle Congress could reform it anytime they wanted to, but the reforms were sufficiently popular uh, that any time the Congress looked like they were even thinking about a significant reform, uh, there would be a lot of pushback from the uh, electorate uh, and they would back off and in the end not do anything. So, uh, so because of the, the popularity of, this, of, the, of these reforms, the, the reforms have obtained what I call quasi-constitutional <coughs> authority in our system and they're, and, <coughs> and they're very Difficult to reform. And, and they're still with us. So the trajectory of taxes and benefits spelled out in the Greenspan reforms is essentially exactly what we have today, uh, nearly 40 years after the bill was passed. 
So it's one of the very few cases where you can look at something and say, look, this is a, a place where Congress was thinking long term and actually committed to a policy that, uh, uh, that has been in place long term. Uh, but of course, the reason that uh, it's still in place is because they were politically popular. The program raised taxes uh, uh, and uh, significantly, uh, again, it was, it was because the trust fund was running out in the, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, that they were able to do this. It was kind of a crisis mentality, uh, not as serious as the crisis we're facing now uh, in terms of funding, but uh, an important, an important uh, uh, crisis nonetheless that motivated reforms. Uh, benefit levels, uh, I think, might have been slightly raised. They weren't raised very much, but but they were. Uh, what, what, but what what was done was to index the benefits for inflation. Uh, in the 1970s, there was a very long period of quite high inflation, uh, and the previous benefit levels were not indexed, uh, and and so uh, the real you know, purchasing power of the benefits fluctuated uh, during the 70s, even with the increases in benefits passed by the Congress. Uh, and in general, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of kind of uh, stress, right? If you have something that's worth, say, you're getting $1,000 a month uh, now, and you know you've got 20% inflation, 15% inflation, which we did hit a few times uh, in, in that period, uh, well, at the end of the year, it could be $800 instead of uh, uh, 1000 And the year after that, it could be 700 So you can see how uh, the, the perception that if the, if the benefit levels weren't keeping up with inflation is that the benefits would basically evaporate. They would go away through time. And it would be like not having the program at all. So the indexing benefits was a way of taking inflation out of the uh, equation as far as retired people were concerned at least with, with respect to their benefits from Social Security. Well, um, because the Greenspan Commission was also aware that the baby boom, boomer generation would be retiring and that there would be this um, increase in outgoes associated with uh, both increases in longevity and increases in the number of, of people retiring relative to the people paying into the system, uh, they tried to create this very large trust fund uh, by setting taxes high enough that they would be uh, larger than the benefits paid out for many years. And in fact, they were higher than, than the payouts until uh, very recently uh, for both Medicare and, uh, and Social Security. Uh, so the surplus this trust fund, which which became enormous, it's, uh, I forget the number off the top of my head, it's well over a trillion dollars, uh, was loaned to Congress. Okay, and of course, what Congress does with it is not invested, they spend it, right? So so all the money that was uh, accumulated in the trust fund uh, was spent by Congress, but Congress signed basic IOUs, and, you know, they issued bonds to the Social Security Administration that they promised to pay uh, when Social Security needs the money. Um, so if you think about it, uh, that trust fund in terms of paying for the retirement uh, of, of the baby boomers uh, is not really doing much for the overall tax system, uh, fiscal system in the United States, because in order to, uh, to get the money from Congress, the Social Security Administration takes one of these bonds over and says, here's a, hundred, a bond for $100 million. Uh, please hand me $100 million in cash so I can send it out to my retired people that uh, are, are, are waiting for their checks. And the Congress is, you know, sitting there thinking, well, gee, I need to come up with $100 million. Where do I, how do I do that? Well, I either raise taxes, okay, um, other taxes than the Social Security tax, uh, or I, uh, I sell bonds on the international market to replace the bonds that I'm redeeming uh, for the Social Security Administration. So... It actually turns out that in terms of the cash flow of the treasury, it makes no difference that there's a, there's a trust fund at all, right? The, you, you still have to raise taxes or increase borrowing uh, when the, the program, when the social security program is spending more money, putting out more benefits than it's coming in through the tax, the earmarked taxes that fund the program. Uh, 
And I talked to people who were members of the Greenspan Commission, and they said that this was not realized by them at the time that they uh, put the program together. They actually thought the trust fund was, in a sense, more independent than it really turns out to be. Uh, they'd forgotten that uh, if you just loan the money to Congress, Congress naturally will spend the money uh, uh, and, and use that source of funding instead of other funding that they might have uh, otherwise had to use, namely raising taxes to pay for things uh, or borrowing uh, in international bond markets for uh, to pay for them. Okay, so the fact that it was loaned to Congress is important and the fact that the trust fund uh, uh, doesn't solve the real problem uh, the real financial problem that we're facing right now, uh, but, but rather uh, it, it, it does commit uh, the Congress to pay back uh, these bonds. And so that commitment is worth something, okay? And it's, and, it would, and it's clearly a stronger commitment than it would be if the bonds didn't exist. So in that sense, it's politically relevant, but only as a kind of uh, promise made by Congress to pay off these bonds uh, to the Social Security Administration. So uh, the program has been cash flow positive until recently. Um, uh, and so uh, we haven't had to top, tap into the trust funds very much. Now, of course, I just said that tapping into the trust funds doesn't mean much. It just means Congress has to raise other taxes or bar do other, engage in other borrowing. Uh, 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 but it, you do have this uh, formal promise from Congress uh, to uh, pay off the bonds as, as Social Security tries to redeem them to, to, to fund these uh, benefits. Uh, and it turns out that from the accounting of this, that uh, in terms of just cash flow, if the, if the Congress decided, hey, I'm not going to pay for any of these bonds anymore, forget it. The trust fund is worthless. You know, we're just not going to do it. Or the, or the bonds run out and they don't feel like they have to top up the program afterwards. Uh, then benefit levels would shrink by about 20%, I think is what the number is. Um, and so it's not the case that when the trust fund goes away, the program goes to zero, okay? But if it had to go back to cash flow uh, balance, uh, it, would, it, would, it re would require reductions in average benefits of about 20%. Uh, Medicare is, is in worse shape. It's cash flow negative uh, already. Uh, and that's partly because healthcare costs have just been rising uh, through time at an increasing rate. Uh, partly because the menu of treatments has been expanding through time, uh, actually mainly because the menu of treatments has been expanding through time, but also because of the baby boomers getting to the age where a lot of health problems creep into their lives uh, and, and they have to, uh, uh, and they want to deal with them by uh, getting the, the, uh, the insurance benefits from the Medicare programs that pays for those you know, treatments that they need. Uh, <clears throat> So um, the current crisis for Medicare is greater because that on that trajectory, the taxes would have to really increase a lot uh, to cover the difference between uh, outgoes uh, and the inflows from the earmarked tax. Uh, so it's much easier to think about how to solve the crisis, as we'll see next in, 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 in the next lecture or two, um, through tax increases. Uh, and then it is to think about how you would solve the Medi uh, Medicare problems. Of course, you could solve the Medicare problems to, to a large extent simply, simply by saying, that's it. We're not going to pay for any new extravagant treatments. We're just going to keep, you know, with uh, the 2020 level of Medicare uh, medical uh, the, uh, treatments that exist. And uh, we're happy to include uh, new uh, innovations that lower costs, but we're not going to take any extravagant new, new programs on and fund those. So you could think of ways to, to deal with this. And I, that's why I put the, the, the term crisis in quotes. For me, a crisis is kind of a surprise event that forces you to make a decision quickly uh, where you don't really have time to think about the best strategy to deal with it. Uh, whereas something that you can see coming 20 years ahead it's not a crisis. It's just something you should plan for. Uh, the fact that Congress hasn't wanted to uh, plan for it seriously and, and take up, tackle the reforms uh, that were, uh, were uh, 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 like the ones adopted during the Greenspan reform period in, in the 1980s, uh, it's just uh, a sign of, uh, of, of modern day politics, I guess. Uh, voters aren't as worried 
enough, and the border's not worried enough about this to press, pressure Congress to do anything. So, <clears throat> in terms of the Greenspan reform, what's really important is that it's their durability, it's successful uh, insulation of most of the program from day-to-day uh, -day politics, uh, the fact that it raised taxes, uh, generated surplus, surplus funds uh, for 30-plus uh, years, um, and accumulated a monstrous uh, trust fund, uh, but that uh, because the trust fund was loaned to Congress uh, and spent uh, in order to redeem the bonds that uh, it, uh, when Social Security Administration presents them to Congress to be paid, they'll have to uh, raise taxes or borrow more money, the same steps they would have to take if there had been no trust fund in, in, uh, at all. Uh, the main difference is that during the interve interve intervening period, uh, taxes were a bit lower than they would otherwise be, borrowing on the international bond markets were lower than they otherwise would be, and government services were a bit higher than they otherwise would be without that trust fund. Whether that's a good thing or not, I leave up to you to, uh, to decide. Uh, and, and, uh, and we'll talk about deficits and tax reform and in the next couple of applied lectures uh, after I get back and then uh, you know before Thanksgiving. So take care, that's all for now. I'll see you uh, after the elections.